Hey everybody, welcome to the Linux Cast. I'm your host Matt, and I'm Tyler, and I'm Drew. Yeah, that seemed weird going in the other direction. I'm just saying, <laughs> I think it was all out of order. Maybe all fucked up. All right. So first off, welcome to Linux Cast. We did take last week off because I was busy with work, and then this week. It went completely out of my mind because I'm on vacation. I'm not working at the moment. I'm not like on vacation, like in a tropical destination. I'm just, you know, not working. And I have, I came very close to saying, sorry guys, can't do the podcast tonight. I don't want to do it. Uh, As you can tell, there haven't been any videos on my channel lately because I've just been between work and then not wanting to do anything. I don't want to do anything. So anyways, that's... That's me and Matt's rambling. <laughs> Anyways, welcome to the Linux Cast. We talk about Linuxy things. We're going to do that tonight, and uh, as usual. But before we do, we're going to jump around the horn, and Matt's going to stop talking for a minute, and Drew is going to tell us what he's done this week in FOSS. A couple weeks ago, last podcast, I mentioned I was getting into MK Docs, and about a week ago, I put out a video on using MK Docs and how to. I'm storing my files on GitHub, but then hosting the website actually using Cloudflare pages. So after the video, I continued to work on it and I may want to do an update video because I've learned so much after the fact. Steve from Zero Linux and I were going back and forth with ideas and plugins and he actually did two MK Docs websites in the last week. So justaguylinux.com is a more streamlined MK Docs experience than even a week ago. Speaking of Cloudflare, by the way, though, for those of you who have domain names that you manage, I've been using Namecheap since Google domains sold out. But after some price changes, I've decided to move half of my domain portfolio over to Cloudflare because it's cheaper and has really good DNS tools. So just if you're looking for a, uh, a domain name provider, I'm, I'm going with Cloudflare right now. So, so cheap is in how cheap? So like when I was a dot com on Namecheap right now is about $16 for the year. And on Cloudflare, it's just over 10. So is there cheaper. is there is some definite savings there. I got contacted also by a YouTuber called Reluctant Anarchist, who's on YouTube who wanted, to, who wanted me to record a short video about my, my recording setup for doing YouTube videos. And I did that for him, but let him know that it's not that, it's not that saucy or special or anything like that. I've been, I said, you realize I don't even edit my videos. I you, you know, most people are using Caden Live. I just do like little sn- snippets and then string them all together in command line and that's it. So anyway, I, I did it for him, but and it should be out in the next week or so. Yeah, and he, asked, he asked me too, sorry. Oh, <laughs> good. Okay. I haven't done did you it do yet, it? Though. I haven't done it yet, though. I've been lazier enough. Okay. <laughs> I've also been working on a video for about six hours, which is really, really long for me. So it's one of those things where, remember we did this video, sorry, the uh, podcast rather, when we talked about our hacks for Linux and... You and I, Matt, both talked about what I was talking about, snapshots, and you talked about Snapper. And I thought to myself, I need to do something on Debian using Snapper. And it's taking me a really stinking long time to put out this video because of all the hoops you have to jump through to get Snapper to work right. It's intensive. I I usually, like I said before, I usually do a bunch of segments and then string them all together. I never get above like 20-ish. I'm at 25 segments right now, and that is only about halfway done. It's uh, Now that I've said it, though, I'm almost committing to actually finishing the process, and I guess I have to now. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing in, in, in my time. So that's one of the reasons why I like OpenSUSE, because they do all that nonsense for you. It's I, I, wow. Yeah. It's, it's hard. just as bad on Arch because yeah. you, even though a lot of the packages and stuff are there and already compiled and stuff, you still got to do all the tie ins. And if you don't have a certain dependency, I'll go, like, oh my goodness, it doesn't tie in with Grub and you got to do all that stuff. It's, it's, it's horrible. All right, Tyler, what about you? What have you been doing this week other, other than, v, <laughs> other than <laughs> VR? <laughs> Pretty much nothing really relating to Linux. I've actually spent this past week not 
not really tied to a computer at all. I mean, I've hopped on this computer that I use for VR just just to hop on Discord occasionally, but I've mainly been riding my electric skateboard around town and work. Just that's really it. I've got a much different schedule. I work in the morning till the early, not really early afternoon, pretty much dinner time. So I don't really have a ton of time in the mornings to sit down at the computer like I used to. So that kind of stinks, but I mean, at least I'm enjoying work. Are Tyler's growing up and becoming a true adult? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you have a birthday recently too? I did. Yeah. yeah. Happy. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I definitely almost forgot about it and technically i did forget about it because it was the day before my birthday when i was reminded it was going to be my birthday i was like oh yeah that's right (laughs) (laughs) turned all of how old are you now tyler 27 jesus Mm -hmm. Uh, that was my favorite year just so you know that so this is your year tyler is all i'm saying is this is your that was my favorite year I have a feeling it's going to be a fun one for multiple reasons. All right. So, yeah. Many happy returns, as they say. All right. Thank you. So, t- Tyler doesn't know what Linux is anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yep. so, let's just go ahead and move on to me. I have spent the last two days. So, I talked about, the, I think I talked about this last time we are on the podcast, where the website that I've been using, which uses used Eleventy, which is a static site generator, Yours set it up for me a couple of years ago. It worked fine, and then it stopped fine. It turned out that the developer put... So the version 3.0 is coming up soon. But one of the dependencies, they pushed it too early, and it relies on 3.0, but 3.0 actually isn't out yet. So that's what was causing all the problems. They won't tell you when 3.0 is coming out, by the way, so you're kind of screwed and your website doesn't work. So what I decided to do was look for something different. Now, I had many different options. I was I boiled it down between just doing a WordPress, which I knew how to do. I did not want to do that. hate WordPress with a passion. Or I could set up Jekyll, which it turns out I don't know shit about Ruby. Like, zero zero things about ruby like none like i i can get i can get by with haskell and c and c plus plus i even know a little bit of c sharp i know a lot of python i know bash i don't know crap anything about ruby and it showed like i could not even get it to install properly because there's just as many ruby libraries as there are pythons it turned out or at least it seems like that to me it was like overwhelming anyways and the other option was hugo I didn't really want to do Hugo because everyone does Hugo because I wanted to be different, but I ended up with going with Hugo and I spent the last two days setting that up. Uh, setting it up wasn't hard until the moment I got up to actually putting it on GitLab and making it a page. That was a pain in the ass. Everything seemed to have gone wrong to start trying to set that up as a GitLab page. The privacy, the the permissions were all wrong. It kept failing the pipelines because one of the sub modules didn't have the right URL attached to it. So I ended up having to create, I I had created my own theme, but it was kind of like forked off another theme, but I completely redid it. So I had to take that out, put it in its own repository, make it into a Git submodule, which I had no clue how to do. Uh, Turns out not to be that hard, but I had no clue how to do it. And and then import it into the Hugo project. And it was a, it was a mess trying to get up there. Finally got there. I did a ton of scripting in order to make this thing automated. So I can, if I update the theme, I can run on this script and it will push everything where it needs to go. I can up, do it for, if I wanted to update a post or put a post up there, I have a script for that. I also created one for Git. I created a, another one. I, I've been scripting like crazy. So if you go to the linuxcast.org right now, you'll see a site that looks very much like the old site. And I'm very proud of the fact that I did that because your set up the last one for me and did all the CSS work. I had no clue how to do any of that stuff. Like my CSS is rusty, like, like Detroit Motor City rusty (laughs) so bad. So I had to, I had to basically get back into CSS all over again, get all that stuff worked up and it's there and it took forever. Now it's not finished by any means. So I had to figure out how to create pages that weren't going to show up in the blog feed. I've kind of done that. So I've got our contact page and the patron page and stuff like that. I got that stuff shown up where it's not actually in the blog feed. But I haven't been able to figure out how to get the ep- the, like the previous episodes up there and not have them included in the blog feed. I haven't figured that out yet. The way that 
chat gpt told me how to do it did not work so <laughs> i was there i'm just saying chat, chat gpt giving you a wrong answer no um <laughs> so i i gotta figure that out i think i have the reason the way to do it there's like a a, a headless mode that you can use that supposedly keeps it out of the out of the feed so i need to do that i also need to set up the rss so just so for all those of you out there who subscribed to the rss feed of my website just know this eventually when i get that set up the url will probably be different so you'll have to resubscribe so there you go uh, that's basically all i've done this week oh also <laughs> i did the traditional mat uh, getting sick of kwin uh, crashing on me all the damn time and i went to gnome realized uh, once again that i hate gnome with a fiery passion of a thousand burning suns crawled my way back and kde was gracious enough to take my ass back <laughs> I'm, I'm still i'm back on kde I, I tried to go to a window manager i even set my monitors back up into a three monitor setup instead of just the two so i don't have the weird fucking aspect ratio fuck me is hyperland still the buggiest piece of shit in the entire country it is so bad i got i i i i I can't even name one of the bugs. There were so many that were just going wrong. I don't know if it's that the OpenSUSE version is like older or something, and maybe just there's some inc incompatibilities there or something that's going on. Uh, I was having problems with copy and paste, and, and I, I had weird flickering issues. It was not great. Now, And that had nothing to do with NVIDIA, because I don't have an NVIDIA card. So if they tell me, oh, it's a NVIDIA problem, I don't have NVIDIA in this machine. So... I'm back on KDE. I hate it with passion. There's nothing good on Linux. Linux sucks. Uh, I'm going to use Windows. Uh, <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> it's just, wh why can't I just have something that's stable that's not GNOME? Like, GNOME is stable, but it's horrible. I, I, well, I mean, I hate I hate to be that dude. There is nothing more NixOS user I could do. <clears throat> but... You know, if you want a stable hyperland, you just install NixOS. I don't, problem uh, solved. Somebody, well, I mean, you switch over to Flakes, but somebody in somebody in the Discord told me to do that too, and I was like, no, I'm more <laughs> likely to use Linux Mint than I am NixOS. I'm just going to put that out there, okay? Yeah, and I know XFC guys, but I, even with a three monitor setup having this three monitor thing here it's still a, a wonky combination of weird resolutions xorg just doesn't handle that well okay it, and those people are like oh well you can do this this and this and it's okay like i don't want just okay i have okay right now i don't need to move on to another thing of okay where i have to do another work a lot of work to get into the ver version of okay so i'm just gonna I, i'm gonna i'm gonna use kd i'm not gonna touch it very often because if i touch it it breaks. <laughs> like, like yesterday when I was doing the, doing the website, I had like four browser windows open. So, so I had like the the Hugo server up in one, and I had like the GitHub watching the pipelines or whatever, all this stuff, right? Every time I dragged something, one of the browsers somewhere, all the other ones would flicker like I'm, they were trying to give me a seizure. And I was like, "What are you doing? Why? H how? How?" I I don't understand how it's 2024 and we still have these problems. Like this can't displaying an image on the screen is like the thing you have to be able to do, right? <laughs> like that's the one thing you have to get right. It's like you, if you're going to build a car, there's certain things that you have to do right. And one of those things is steering. And if you don't, it's a sucky car. That's, that's what KDE is for me. Like, like you just don't tried to right. get Qtile running on, on Wayland. On X Wayland or Wayland? Every once in a while, it'll be okay. And then they'll push something and it will break. Now, I did it's, try it. It's Qtile, brother. Like, all, no, just, all they got to do is update it and it breaks. I, and I it, was That was a more of a curiosity question than anything yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, like, so it, it's better than it used to be by far. Like, it used to not even be running. The problem with Qtile and Wayland is that it doesn't have the ecosystem of really cool gadgets the Hyperland does. So, like, the Hyperland dev, you know, Hyper Cursor and Hyper Paper and, you know, Hyper Lock and all this stuff that goes along with it. With Qtile, it's just Qtile. And if you want any of those fancy things like a, like a lock screen and all that stuff or or whatever that goes into Wayland, you have to go find other tools to do that and usually you just end up using the Sway stuff, which is fine. It just doesn't feel as complete of an experience. Uh, well, I mean, your choices are literally the Sway options or the Hyperland options. So it just feels mix-matched. And, I mean, I don't know. Me personally, I couldn't use Qtile on Wayland and feel safe about it. For the same reason, I couldn't use Qtile on X and feel safe about it. 
They they push stuff that breaks your config all the time. And I'm granted, other than that, I love Qtile. It really is a great tiling window manager. I used it for a little bit because I was I, I've been trying to find a different window manager for because because Katie's been treating me like dog shit, and, and there's no real good other, other Wayland option other than GNOME. And no, <laughs> so. I tried Qtile, just the regular XOR. I tried to go to XOR, guys. Like, I tried. Tried to go back. And it doesn't... It wasn't a horrible experience once I got past the resolution. I did find out a way to make the X cursor work so that the, the cursor... So, the weird thing is if if you have multiple different resolutions and you ha- it scales the cursor on for the higher resolutions. So, it looks normal on the higher resolutions, but once you go into the lower resolution, the cursor is, like, gigantically big. It's huge. So you can change that with X cursor in your X resources file, but it took me forever to figure out that. And then for whatever reason, the Qtile had this weird focus bug where the, the like it would lose focus of a window for whatever reason when you activated a scratch pad. I'm not sure if I was just doing something wrong. I'm, I feel like I felt like a complete effing noob again uh, when it went to a window manager. So anyways, that's everything that I did in the last two weeks. I'm having a midlife crisis or something. I don't know. Anyways, that's it for this one. Let's go ahead and move on to the main topic, which is a cleverly titled, Should Your Mom Use Linux? But really what the topic here is, do you guys think that it is a good idea to install Linux on a non-technical user's PC? And and I know I'm making a generalization by saying that your moms aren't technologically advanced, but <laughs> you know, I'm just going by my own mother, I'm, so, You're not I'm wrong. <laughs> making assumptions that I think are fairly fair here. So, Drew, why don't you go ahead first? Why don't do you think that it would be appropriate, just in, in general? You don't have to apply it to any of your personal family members, but just in general. To, <laughs> well, to, I mean, you can do that, but <laughs> to install Linux on a non-technical user's family member's computer. Of course they can. <laughs> of course, obviously. No, you know, okay. So first of all, in a real world, if there, if I'm answering this question and I'm having to actually talk about my own mother, that woman's not touching a computer at all, period. She can barely touch a phone, okay? I mean, she's in her 80s, so no, <laughs> she's not even going to touch a computer. Now, my, you know, me and my wife are... Tyler's parents age, you know, or actually they're probably a little bit younger, but in, if I had to, my wife is obviously a windows user. I've talked about it before. The biggest problem with her in trying to get her to move over to Linux is outlook period. And she will not be moving over because she wants outlook and she just wants stuff to work. She is super averse to any type of change whatsoever. She just does not want, she's like, Drew, do not touch my computer. I do not want you to, to," because she thinks that if I touch her computer and do anything, she's going to have to actually re-log back into websites. And that constitutes a breach that she doesn't even want to deal with, okay? When I think about other people though, that I have tried to move to non-technical people that have that I've tried to move over to Linux. They're simply just doing things that you could do in Chrome OS, like using the browser or using any th- web tool. And they're fine, 100% fine with doing any of those things because non-technical people, all they really care about is the things that I just mentioned. You know, do they ha- does it have a browser? Good. Does it, you know, can I use YouTube? Can I (laughs) find stuff online? Can I go to Amazon and order things? Yes, you can do all those things. And so, yeah, they're, they're a hundred percent okay with that. And some of them are using like Google docs and things like that. And that's fine as well. You don't have to have, I mean, moving over to Linux doesn't change any part of their workflow if you're talking about those things in particular. But so, yeah, I've actually had just to, you know, put a, put a pin on it, but I've actually had more success in people moving from Mac OS to Linux as opposed to windows to Linux. I don't know why it just seems like they're more willing to do those things. And I get, 
you know, where Mac OS came from as far as having a Unix background and so on. But still, they're more interest they're more easily swayed, I guess, to go from Mac OS to, to Linux. Well, I will add that makes sense to me because you know, if you spent like two thousand, three thousand dollars on your last computer, the I the idea of being able to revive older hardware or have something that you may not have to upgrade that's that expensive next time if you want to get the latest and greatest it's kind of appealing i I could see the willingness to change there more because i mean as somebody who's bought a mac your wallet hurts after that i thought it set itself on fire i mean literally you walk out of the the apple store and you just your wallet just explodes that's how it felt (laughs) that's how it felt (laughs) But I mean, with with me, I'll say my family is kind of unique in the sense all of my close family runs Linux. Like my mother runs Ubuntu and none of them were like me hard pressing them to like, you need to switch over to Linux because it's better or whatever. It's mainly came from they're your average browser users who click links they probably shouldn't and get viruses so instead of getting viruses i installed pretty much all of my family that i've like installed linux on their computers it always is something like linux mint or like bungie or something like that where it it kind of mimics the like windows aesthetic so it's easier to use my grandmother is the oddity out of them i installed like I showed her pictures of like different options, like Fedora, Linux Mint, like Ubuntu Bungie, like just different options. And she, she really wanted to use Fedora. Fedora seemed really appealing to her. And I mean, it's very different, but oddly enough, she has an easier time with using that than at windows or Mac. She's used windows Mac uh, she, ha- she really likes it. She, I think I've told this story before, but I'm, and I'm a little unsure of the details, but I'm pretty sure she called me or had me come over, uh, cause she wanted to install zoom and thought she couldn't do it. But I told, I told her just load up the software center. I may have been there with her and showed her, but just click on software, search zoom. And she was like, oh, there it is. You know, the install button, like Fedora surprisingly enough was one of the easiest transitions I've ever seen someone make, especially being my grandmother make to Linux. And I, th- I think it's just cause it's very simple. Like there's not a lot of complexity to Fedora, ex- ex- especially the aesthetic of it is very simple, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's the best idea to just throw Linux on a non-technical person's computer and then just deuce, like leave out like, that's not a good idea at all. My mom actually complains more at me to not update her computer than to update it. She treats it like it's still a Windows system. She's very nervous about updates. But I have to go in there and apply security updates that should have been applied like three months ago, but whatever. <laughs> okay, so I've had so just between my mom and my dad, I've had split success. Um, my dad. He hates updates with a passion and always has. He wanted to, often wanted to toss his computer away when Windows would do an automatic update because he do, like he, he doesn't understand the purpose behind updates. Like he just doesn't want them. He has no interest in new features. He just wants the damn thing to work. And all he does is get into Chrome and watch YouTube, put puzzles together, and play solitaire. That's all he does. So what I did was I installed Ubuntu for him. And that thing hasn't been updated in years. Doesn't matter. Who cares? I, I, it just it's Ubuntu. He doesn't need updates. He he doesn't do anything mission critical on it and, and uh, whatever. So it just it just works. He never sees an update. He never has to restart the computer if he doesn't want to. Uh, and he he's had a perfect uh, transition over because all he does is open up Chrome. The, the, the hardest thing that had that he had to do was from time to time, Chrome will ask him for a password in order to, for it to remember things because it needs it needs access to uh, Polkit. And uh, so I just made dad the password so he can easily remember it. And he bitched and complained about having to have that password 
for a while. Um, but I was like, that's just that's the way that works. Unfortunately, you can't do it any other way. Now, my mom, I couldn't pay her a billion dollars to use Linux. Um, <laughs> like, she is attached to the way she does things, and the. <laughs> Everyone says, Matt, you're obsessed with file managers. I get it from my mother. Okay, I swear I do. Because she, uh, first off, she's very disorganized when it comes to her files. They're all shoved in one directory. I, I can't get her to make folders. Okay, guys, I tried. I, I really she, did. <laughs> now, she's not a Mac user, right? No, she's a Windows user. That's insane. I normally see that on Mac users. Yeah, yeah. It's all... The good news is it's not the desktop directory. It's another okay, directory. Cool. But cool. still... Everything is in there between, well, I guess it's two directories. She uses pictures for pictures and then everything else is in the downloads directory. It just lives there. Right. And the, so the problem with that when it, and to bring it back to the file managers thing is that in order to find something, she has to be able to search for it. And you know, the one thing that file pickers aren't good on in Linux searching for shit. You can't search for anything on Linux in a file picker. It just doesn't work. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure that like the GTK file picker doesn't even have search, or at least it didn't the last time I checked. It may now. Who knows? We, with portals and stuff, they've done a lot of changing, so it's possible that they're searching for uh, in there now. The the QT one also didn't have easy easy search. Uh, in, and, and when I say file picker, I'm talking about that thing that you when you press in a website uh, open file or whatever, it pops up and it's the file picker, right? If it, and without that search functionality, she couldn't do it. Like it just wouldn't work. And then she had a hard time taking screenshots because she's she's very used to the the snippet tool on Windows, and she uses it constantly, like all the time, to take stuff, to take sc- screenshots of stuff on her computer. And I was like, well, you know, we can. Uh, my dumbass, when I tried to get her to do so, here's just a cautionary wall. I thought the best thing to do would be to put her on <laughs> yeah forgive my forgive my naivety I put her on Arch Linux. Now, I know what you're thinking, Matt. What the fuck are you talking about? Why'd you put her on Arch Linux? Well, I I don't know why I did the Arch part, but what I really really wanted was KDE. And I thought KDE was a good idea because it out of the box, it basically looked like Windows and I thought that it would have a good enough file picker that it would actually work. It didn't. Pro tip. First Arch Linux is a bad idea for someone who has no interest in Linux, obviously. Uh, Dumbass man. Two, KDE is not a good option for new users who have no technical skills whatsoever. It just doesn't work for them whatsoever. Every And it's not that there's too many settings. That's true. But my mom never is going to get into the settings anyways. It's that the applications that they sometimes have to use are too too complex. Have you ever seen Spectacle before? Spectacle is their screenshot thing. It's like you have to have a fucking degree in order to use it. It's the stupidest thing ever. Uh, and while well, it's fine for me, I can figure it out. For her, not going to happen. It just, did, it just did not work whatsoever. I even changed, I went so far as to change the Spectacle icon to be the snippet tool. She, it just didn't happen. Linux lasted about a day on her computer, and she wanted to go back to Windows. And since then, because uh, uh, she has constant problems with Windows, constant problems. We, we just spent the last three weeks trying to get it fixed at, at Dell, and they kept breaking the computer more than what it was when we asked them to fix it. And even now, it's still not perfect. But every time I tell her, Matt, or I tell her, Mom, I, I, I'll install Linux on there. It'll work better. It'll be faster. The touch screen will work better than it does on Windows. Uh, you'll ha- you'll have you know access to Chrome just like you do now. That part's not going to change. We'll do the screenshot thing. Uh, I'm sure I can rig up something to search in the file picker. She's like, no. Well, Microsoft Absolutely. is doing the screenshots for her anyway, so there you go. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, there so, you go. Yeah, that's true. But <laughs> for for about a year, the, in the snippet tool, there's a, there's been this little banner across, across the top that says, snippet tool is going away. And that is not gone over well with her because it's her primary tool that she uses for things, right? And it's going to eventually go away to something more complicated. Basically, they're, they're combining that and Microsoft Paint or something. It's really fucking weird. And it's the, it's the stupidest thing. Anyways, so for me, my answer to the question is it depends on what type of user you're talking about, right? Because if they do things and they're very reliant on certain programs, like Drew, your wife is reliant on Outlook, right? In that situation, that's probably not going to work as well as if somebody is just using Chrome. Like if they just use Chrome, that's the type of 
user who is perfect for Linux because it doesn't matter if you install Budgie or XFCE or Cinnamon. They ain't going to get into any of that stuff. All they care about is can I get to Chrome, which you, the technical support person, can just pin Chrome to the start menu or the, the taskbar and they're happy to go, right? That's great. But for people who are reliant on certain programs like my mom with a snipping tool, your wife with the Outlook, you know, that's when it becomes a lot harder because they're reliant on those things. And I'm going to make an ageist statement here for just a second. The, and there's nothing against old people. It's just mostly the truth, right? Once you get to a certain age, you don't like change. Like I'm getting to that. I mean, you get into your forties, you start wanting things to stay the same as much as possible. I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions out there and I apologize if you're that exception, but most people older than me have that thing where they just don't want to experience change whatsoever. And when things change, they get upset about it. And when you have to, one of the primary things you have to do on Linux is oftentimes you have to find alternatives to the way that you do things. And that means change. And if you were averse to change, you ain't going to have a good time on Linux. It's just, even even if, Tyler, you mentioned installing on your relatives everything that looks like Windows as much as possible, even if you go through as much as possible, even if you install that, what, what was that thing that went around a, a few months ago? It was like Ubuntu? Me, Ubuntu, that's it. It just looked exactly the best, like... The best operating system Right, it looked exactly like Windows 7 or whatever it was. Even if you installed that, first of all, don't do that, but uh, even if you did, and it looked exactly like Windows, it even had the fucking watermarks and you had to pay for it and everything, and it had the spyware, it was, it was great. It's, there's still going to be some change there, and that's going to be what's going to be your your little you know, th thing. Also, what you said earlier about not you know walking away after you do it, that's exactly what we should talk about next. Because all three of us have installed Linux for other people on their computer. Are you guys the technical support for those people you've transitioned? 100%. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. I will mention something else, too, though. One of the candidates that you should be looking for if you want to convert somebody over from Windows to Linux is people with older hardware that are like, man, I this Windows is so bogged down. I can't do anything with it. I says, if you can't use it, try it. Just try it. See if it will solve your problem. I mean, after all, like we've said before, you're only using it to surf the web. What what more do you need? You know, you just need something that works and has a browser. You're done. And it can resurrect basically these, these ancient computers that are running some, you know, some incredibly bastardized version of Windows that it's gone through update after update after update. And it just doesn't even, it just slows to an absolute crawl. Yeah, that, that and the people who are out there that, uh, are constantly plagued with viruses. That has been my most like successful route with people who like need something new and me talking to them about Linux and it working out. Like, yeah, if you constantly get viruses just because you're on the internet, it helps out a lot because you know them random downloads or extensions just don't do the same. They don't hit the same on the Linux system. <laughs> but you're right, Matt. You we are. I mean, I think all of us have that like <laughs> that hat that we wear your tech support hat is on at all times when you're talking about trying to convert somebody or trying to help them out by put you can't actually do what tyler did it's like here's fedora deuces goodbye yes. you know? <laughs> <laughs> my grandmother is definitely an edge case i i couldn't expect most like women in their seventies to have a totally different operating system that looks completely different and somehow not have any problem. Like she's, she hasn't called me. Like she figured out how to use the, like, cause Gnome comes with a scanner app and she needed to not only print something, but scan something. Mm. So she figured out how to use that app on her own. Nice. I can't, Most I people would can't, probably need help. Can't even imagine that situation in my in my house. <laughs> uh, like, uh, I, uh, there'd be there'd be there'd be arguments and anger and, <laughs> and not, it'd be not great. Because if someone said, "Matt, you have to scan something on Windows," 
I don't know if that I could figure it out. Like I, I haven't used so I used Windows very briefly, briefly a couple months ago with that computer that I've been editing on. It was a horrendous experience. I never want to have that experience again. Uh, so much so I, I've completely ye- ye- yeeted uh, uh, Windows right off from it and booted it out into the to the cold, harsh winter, never to be hopefully seen again. I hope that thing dies. I'm sorry, <laughs> a little angry there. Uh, but anyways, I installed Bluefin on there. And but if somebody asked me, you know, you told me you got to put Windows back on there and you got to do this, this, and this, and I, I'll be like. I could probably figure it out, but it's going to be a painful situation the entire way through. And, and every time I try to convince someone in my family to use Linux, I try to think of my experience using Windows. Because for me, that's going to be like them trying to use Linux. Because I haven't used Windows full time in seven years. Like, there are things there. Well, yeah, the, the paradigm is basically the same. Windows has its quirks, and if you're away from it long enough, you're going to be surprised when those quirks pop up. Things like, oh, I don't know, a VPN ad just that's on the desktop that won't go away. You can't dismiss it. Like, it's there, right? And, you know, so things like that. And, and or, you know, trying to get certain hardware things or the, the just painful remembrances of having to go through and try to find the, the, a, a driver for your motherboard that's on some random website. You don't know if it's the right version or, or not. You have to download it. And the wizard looks like it was developed or designed in 1995, you know, and, you know, because wizards haven't actually changed in the last 30 years. And, and, you know, so I try to keep in mind that, you know, I have this experience on Windows and I'm somewhat technically, you know, minded that if someone who knows less about tech than me tries to use Win- Linux, they probably have the same experience. Now, Tyler, I have a question for you. Did you consider putting your grandmother on something like Silver Blue, where everything is automated in the background? It's basically Fedora, but with no need for your support for updates or anything like that. No, because I, I don't think she has to have it updated. Like, if she updates the system, Fedora is one of those ones where their actual update software is pretty accurate. It track pretty accurately the update and then like forces you to, I, I think normally when you do it through the GUI, it forces you to go ahead and do a reboot. Um, and it's kind of like windows in that way. So I wasn't really worried about her having problems during the update and that kind of stuff. I, I also don't, I don't really see the need to use something like silver blue or something immutable to keep my grandmother from, you know, accidentally fiddling with something she shouldn't, mainly because I know she won't go and fiddle with anything. So I've been getting a schooling on the whole immutable thing and really the whole, you know, messing around with the file system isn't the point of it. Right. Like that, that's that was the thing. That's what people when they first was a thing. That's what everybody said. Like, oh, you can't mess around with the root system. You can't go, you know, accidentally delete your Etsy folder and have things go wrong. Right. Which is true. But that's not really the point of it. From what I the, the, the schooling that I've been taking, because I've been doing this Bluefin review. Right. And that's basically silver blue with a ton of stuff on top. And the whole point of it is literally so you don't touch anything like you don't install programs in any way other than from the software center you can if you i mean if, if you're a nerd you can open the terminal do flat pack install or whatever but really flat hub's right there in the gui you might as well just use that right that's how you install all software and if it's not in the software center it's not available to you as far as you know as a non-technical user if as a technical user you probably know ways around it right and, and updates all of your flat packs automatically update in the background so things like 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 chrome or whatever would be in, in, in chromium and probably in this case but automatically updated that we always have the re- most recent security updates you don't have to worry about it. it doesn't even tell you it's doing it it just does it now as a former windows person i hate it when shit gets updated underneath me and all of a sudden my browser says oh i'm sorry you can't do shit until you've restarted your browser firefox used to do that all the damn time just randomly like i set an update going and then all of a sudden i can no longer do anything because it had just updated firefox 
like I hate that and to have that automatic would piss me off but for someone else who like my dad he doesn't know how to do updates silver blue would or something like that would be perfect for him because it would keep him somewhat up to date basically what I want is the Debian of immutables because then there's not many updates to begin with but when there is an update it would just do them you know it's not going to break because it's Debian and it would keep the applications themselves, which I'm more worried about than the operating system, Linux is going to be fine. Update date. So if he did he did decide he was going to enter credit card information, I didn't have to worry about some you know gigantic hole in, in the in the software, right? So uh, I I I've come around a little bit to the idea of the whole composable distro thing. That is, I think. Eh, Really, those are the type of distros that are ideal for putting on someone else's computer because there's a lot less things that I have to do deal with in order to get that thing uh, maintained or keep that thing maintained. Like things like updates, usually they don't break. And if they do break, all I have to do is go back to a previous like – on Nix, you'd call it a generation, right? Uh, on on Silverblue, they may call it a generation too. I don't know. They call it a snapshot or something, right? You just go back to the previous one and wait until, until the next time it would update and see if it would work again. So, you know, something like that where it's very easy to recover if an update does kill something, but it's probably not going to. And all the actual, the applications just stay up to date. They just do it in the background. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, and there's no the, the key there is there's no interaction whatsoever to the user who doesn't know what they're doing. Like they have no interaction with that situation at all, and that means that they can just carry on doing whatever it is they do. So I really I've really come around to the idea that that situation is what's good uh, for this type of situation. The problem is they're all based on Fedora. <laughs> Like, 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 I like Fedora. For me, I'm not sure. I, and, you know, you, you got really lucky with your grandma there, Tyler. I just don't think that for normal people, Fedora is it. You know, I would love an immutable distro based on Debian or on a, even Ubuntu or something like that. Like, and, and yes, there's one on OpenSUSE, but uh, Aeon or Micro OS, whatever the hell they're calling it these days, not ready yet. Like it, it, it's still in re release candidate form, so maybe eventually. And then even then, I don't think that I'd take OpenSUSE and put it on my mom's laptop. I just, I don't, I don't think so. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a Debian, like I'm gonna throw it out there. But you know, they have unattended upgrades for Debian. You have to set it up that way, but it's something that can be done. Unattended upgrades is something that uh, you can configure on your Debian machine. That's all I wanted to interject right there. It would just keep keep the the Debian itself up to date, right? Not the Yeah. Yeah, might be something to look into. <laughs> it'd, 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 <laughs> I mean, it'd be good cuz right now the, my, the Ubuntu on my dad's laptop it just the, I just don't update it at all ever. Which I don't really care, but still it, it's it's something to think about. It's, it, I I've thought about it constantly or you know from time to time just putting, you know, a GNOME version of like silver blue on there, making it look the same as it does now because he would not enjoy change to something different and just have it running in the background. It works the same, but I don't know. Probably if there was a flat pack version of Chrome, I'd do it, but there's not a flat pack version of Chrome. And if that icon changed from the color artful icon to the blue icon, uh, it would I won't hear. I would. I would never hear the end of it. So that, that's obviously not going to happen. So I don't know. The thing about like, like you can, if you are in the situation where you kind of want the immutable way of doing things, but you don't want to move to an immutable distro, you can use things like Snap. Now I know, shocker, Matt's going to recommend Snap, but Snap does the automatic update thing, like it would happen on a on a immutable, but without the immutable part. It just does it in the background. Um, and there's snaps of pretty much everything these days, even Chrome. So at least I think there's a, a snap of Chrome. So the whole containerized packages format, I think, is kind of a boon for this situation because it handles a lot of the updating stuff that you would normally would you norm you'd normally have to do on your own. In, at least in some cases, not always, all cases. So so just to go around, if you, if you were to put so picture the most uh, or the the least technologically minded person in your family who doesn't currently use Linux. If they decide they came up to you and said that they're interested in using Linux, just this pure hypothetical, what distro 
would you put on their their thing and what desktop environment would you use i'm forcing answers here so tyler why don't you go first because drew was like eh, i don't know <laughs> no i was like what, what do you think i'm gonna say <laughs> i'm gonna be completely honest i missed out on the question so please repeat it <laughs> <laughs> okay P- picture the least technologically minded person in your family who doesn't use currently use linux what distro and desktop environment would you put on their computer if they're interested in switching? And if you say Nix OS, you're fired. I'm just <laughs> zany OS, my friend. <laughs> well, well, wait. So, are we talking about distro or desktop environment? Distro or both. and desktop, both. Both of them. Okay, okay, okay. So, most likely, I- I'm thinking of my most like problematic cousin and like what I'd give him, and like he knows nothing about computers it probably would be ubuntu bungee probably because it's close enough to to windows and appearance but it looks kind of fancy enough that he might deal with any problems he runs into because it looks spiffy so not cinnamon no i would i mean cinnamon is really good but I, i pretty much ever really only ever consider cinnamon an option when we're talking about Linux Mint. And I don't think Linux Mint makes sense for him, mainly because the last time I used Linux Mint, what really made it awesome is like if I was going to like, let's say need to be hand, especially more hands-on with like my family's computers and stuff, Linux Mint's tooling around managing other computers running Linux Mint is really, really good. But I don't know that I would need that or be interested in managing his computer for him. And I don't think he's going to manage anyone else's. So yeah, I'd probably give him Ubuntu Bungie just because that way I can send him an Ubuntu you know, link and at least have it be relevant. Makes sense. All right, Drew, what version of Debian would you put your, (laughs) would you put your family? You know what though? I I actually probably would go. You've been to cinnamon or something like that. Maybe I wanted to be funny and say, I'd put Pantheon on there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you won't have to worry about updates. Yeah. Here's here's Pantheon. It, It looks really cool. It's never going to change. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I, okay. So I, I'm, I would, I would go, I think cinnamon would be the desktop environment. I might go Ubuntu cinnamon. I might go Linux mint right away. Just like, you know, flagship uh, Linux mint. And, and frankly, I would opt for Linux mint Debian edition if they had any kind of technical ability at all. But if they have none, I would probably just opt for the, Linux Mint that with the, with Cinnamon Desktop that would probably be the the easiest easiest transition for anybody. Yeah, I think that that'd be where I would go to. I, I know I have all I've said and said many things about uh, Linux Mint over the years, but for a new user, it really does. You don't have to worry about updates all that often because it only happens every six months, you know, six months or whatever. And they have aut- automation tools, so a lot of that stuff is automated as well. Uh, every, every they've done a really good job of creating GUI tools for stuff. So uh, if they do happen to be an explorer type who can, who gets into the menu and looks at stuff that they probably shouldn't be dealing with, it. a lot of their GUI stuff is well explained, well documented. Uh, Cinnamon looks a lot like Windows, so it's going to be at least somewhat familiar. And if they do get the hankering for some customization, it does have some customization there, so they can play around with that. If they discover it by accident or whatever, they're not going to accidentally break anything because Cinnamon's pretty hardy. So uh, I think Cinnamon with Linux Mint makes a lot of sense. I go back, though, to, to the idea of one of the immutable distros. So it's possible I'd put them on like, cause there is a cinnamon flavored version of silver blue. I think that somebody's created that and not, it'd be pretty easy to create. So I could do that if I wanted the immutable thing. I just, I have so many bad experiences with regular Fedora just to like, Oh, granted the last time I used Fedora Pipewire was still in like, you know, much earlier days and it is now not as stable. So, and 
Fedora always had those problems first because they're on the front lines of Pipewire. So every time I think, oh, well, I'm going to tell someone to use Fedora, I'm thinking back to my experience back when that was the case. And I was like, well, you're on the front lines of everything. You're going to experience the most bugs and stuff. And like, I don't know if that's something that I want to put on someone. And then all that stuff is going to come back on me because I'm the technical support guy. And, you know. So Linux Mint probably where I, I'd want to go. There are people out there like, Matt, why don't you put them on OpenSUSE? Because you're such an OpenSUSE fanboy. Like, eh. like, like I love OpenSUSE. But e- I won't even put them on Leap. Like, like oh, even Leap has too many problems for a new user. It just does. And if they had managed to find Yast, they'd probably never come out again. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. like, 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 I love Yast. It's, Yast is one of the most powerful tools on Linux. It's fantastic, but it's it's horrendously designed and overly complicated. Plus, you can do so much damage to your computer if you get into Yast and do something and you don't know what you're doing. Like, it, I would never point someone not technical to a computer that has Yas installed on it because if they get into it, don't know what they're doing. And it, they have, that's actually one of those GUI programs that you can destroy the computer with with just a few clicks. Yeah. And it doesn't, it does not do a good job at all of warning you when you're doing something you're not supposed to do. Whether that's managing your software repositories or managing your network connection or your firewall or app armor or any of that stuff, you can get in there and seriously fuck your ability to get on the internet. All of your drives, your, your petitions and stuff, you can really seriously mess things up. And it does not warn you at all. Like you, it just like YOLO, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Uh, and uh, not well labeled in half the cases either. So, <laughs> By the way, good suggestion in the chat. They said Zorin OS. I don't know why I have this mental block about Zorin not just not being a distro or something. But yeah, that's, a, that's actually a good suggestion is Zorin OS. Because they, they, I mean, it looks really, really slick. You know, Either you guys ever actually used it though? I've installed it on someone's computer before and okay. used it for a short time. I didn't have any problems with it, but I know they didn't stick with it. Like they ended up getting interested in trying out something else. But like, I mean, it wasn't really a problem. Uh, I've never had a lot of trust behind Zorin. Okay. But that that doesn't mean I distrust them either. I mean, the inter- the, so they had that interesting idea, basically, where they would do be the red hat, but for consumers. So if you wanted to pay them money, you could get them support. So I suppose if you didn't want, if you wanted to install Linux on your grandma's computer, but didn't want to be her support person, first off, douchebag move. Just saying. But if you, but if you are a douchebag, but you wanted to sit, be in that situation, you could pay for Zorin to be the support person behind, you know, that your grandmother. You, you could you could disguise that as a gift when you're doing like when you're setting it up be like hey, yeah and i bought you pro a pro membership so you got support <laughs> you just call this number right here anytime you have problems she's like thank you <laughs> you leave me like oh yes <laughs> yeah. so that i've never actually used it is there actually like a zorn hotline that you call uh, for support, or is it like an email, or like because I it, don't know. Because if it is, that's cool. That's the way that I'd expect. Like if you're gonna pay for something, I want someone actually on the phone with me, right? But the way I imagine, like I don't know if it's true, do they just like give you a, like you pay for it and they give you a link to their Discord server, like. Oh God! <laughs> like that doesn't like I'm paying for a link to a Discord server because yeah, no like no no offense to you guys on Discord, I love y'all, but. And they've helped me through multiple technical support issues, but you guys are not new user friendly, okay? You well, are- Discord servers aren't new user friendly at all, especially someone who doesn't use Discord. I couldn't imagine like my grandmother getting a link to Discord and being like, "I've got to make an account." <laughs> like, there's like so many layers. Dude, to I this. can barely use Discord. Seriously, we we should talk about that for a minute because support is a big thing about this, right? Like, yeah, you got if you install Linux on someone else's computer, you're the tech support. But if you're not around all the time, like you you have you know, your own family, you have your own jobs, you're not going to be there all the time when something goes wrong. And chances are, they they're probably smart enough to go out and try to find support when you're not there, right? And when that happens, and if, if they know, like, let's just say that they know, they know they're using Ubuntu, right? And then they go searching for Ubuntu support. 
that's going to be fine, probably, even though they're going to encounter this vast wealth of knowledge from 20 years ago that may or may not work. But if they discover, like, Ask Ubuntu, chances are they can go there, know what it's a, it's a support a forum support place, and you, they can ask their question, right? But if they're on a different distro that's not Ubuntu, that's when eh, support gets dicey. Plus, there's that whole – when we talked about support in a previous podcast, I don't know, if Drew, if you joined us yet, but we talked about support on a previous podcast, and one of the things that we talked about was not knowing who you're supposed to ask. And that's a big thing here, right? Like if, if you are using, say, I don't know, Thunderbird or whatever, but you're on Ubuntu and you, you're not technologically minded, you may not know what's causing the issue you're having. And who are you supposed to go find support for that thing? Like, do you know to go search through the Thunderbird forums or are you just going to go ask for help in the Ubuntu forums? In which case, if you have a Thunderbird problem and you ask questions in a forum not related to Thunderbird, people are going to get upset because people in forums are assholes, okay? <laughs> I mean, granted, Arch Linux takes us to another level, but if you go and say, like, ask a Manjaro question in the, in the Arch Linux forums, you are going to get crucified. And, it's, you know, and, and that's the thing. Like, if, if you are a brand new user and you, not, you don't know where to ask the question, you're probably just going to go to the distro, you know, place for support. And, you know... Like it or not, you know, you're going to encounter a group of people who are very strict on what's supposed to be there. And when, you know, if it's not supposed to be there, you're going to hear about it. You know, I, I think that it's another whole area where we kind of got to think of like the, the, the support issue. If you're if the tech support guy is not available, you're, you're going to then go encounter the Linux community, which is full of a colorful amount of people with different personalities and varying levels of interest in helping you. That was a very PC way of saying there's, there's assholes in the Linux community sometime. And if your grandma <laughs> knows to go find a support forum somewhere, you know, that, that's going to be an interesting conversation between you and your grandmother when you eventually show up to do the Excuse service. Excuse me. I'm gonna actually going to go over and register the domain name asktyler.com. Hold on a second. Oh, God. <laughs> well, you got that nice cheap domain registrar now, Drew, so you can actually <laughs> oh, do God. it for cheap. <laughs> <laughs> this this email like service like this website's clearly going to host an email service where people ask me stuff <laughs> this needs to have its own inbox no 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 no. what you do is you set up a docker container with one of the custom chat gpt things that you can get on there and just oh, make yeah. that a front end for chat gpt <laughs> they just ask tyler they think it's you but it's really an ai bot in the background yes. and we <laughs> We, we have to give it like a large description of how it should behave and who it thinks it is and like make it like the most cocky, arrogant version of me that also tries to be flirtatious. <laughs> I like this idea. We could probably make money. <laughs> uh, also, like every once in a while, it just says, sorry, can't help you. I'm high. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke too much. Can't type right now. Sorry. And it's and all of the words are misspelled. <laughs> or, or some of some of our more – we're going to pick on Tyler here a little bit. But, 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 Good. But <laughs> – Sorry, decided to tear my computer apart 15 minutes before the podcast. Can't can't actually do it. So. <laughs> That's never happened. Never happened, right, Tyler? Never. No, no. I have never, ever disassembled a computer before a podcast. Never. Uh, some question will come in and say, sorry, on a munchie break. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Someone come and goes in there and asks a Linux question. Sorry, can't help you. Switch to, Lin to Windows again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Mac user. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Some of the comments are the one of the comments this thing has to make, please, is sorry, I'm in the kitchen warming up Pop Tarts. <laughs> Don't worry, just buy a Mac. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> that ended up good. Okay, so anyways, let's go ahead and move on to the last part of the podcast. So I don't know if y'all see this. These are emotional support nuggets. Josh sent this to me, um, and that's because this is the nuggies section of the podcast. Oh, you and gotta show them off for longer than that, man. Very embarrassing. So someone sent me emotional support nuggets. It would have been more fun if it actually had said nuggies on it instead of just nuggets. So you guys see this? It just says nuggets. So half effort, Josh. Half effort. Get it right. If you're gonna do it, at least do it right. All right. Nuggets doesn't bother me. If, if it was nuggets of the week, I'd be fine. 
it's nuggies of the week and it it's a bad word anyways this is the, this is the section of the podcast where we talk about our tips tricks picks apps whatever it is and uh, we talk about things that we like to share with you guys so drew take us away i kind of alluded to it a little bit when i was talking about mk docs and the fact that i'm hosting my website on cloudflare pages so cloudflare pages is my nuggy of the week it is i find it more robust than using GitHub pages. I've never used GitLab pages or anything else, but when it comes right down to it, the Cloudflare pages has some really interesting features, including frameworks for uh, Next.js and Hugo and Jekyll and Hexo and Pelican and MKDocs. And if you are looking to do something as far as a static website, consider Cloudflare pages. For, uh, for hosting. So it and free, s- by the way, free. It stores stuff too, like, like GitLab and stuff, so, or is it? So, yeah. I mean, in the video, I talked about all of my actual uh, documents are being hosted on GitHub. And I set up the connection between that and Cloudflare pages and set the framework as MK Docs. So it, every time I update my GitHub, I add a new document or whatever, it sees that and then rebuilds the entire website on Cloudflare pages, and boom, it's live. So, okay, that's cool. What what advantage do you see? I'm just asking a question. What would be the advantage of using that over just like GitLab or GitHub pages? I thought it was easier doing it though, especially when you're talking about with MK Docs, for example. It's using PHP, and 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 I like the fact that when you set the requirements dot text file, it basically builds out all of these uh, packages for this for this website. And I have like 48 <laughs> packages that get rebuilt every single time Cloudflare pages, every time the website gets deployed. Okay. So I, I think that at least from my perspective, I had a harder time getting cloud, uh, sorry, GitHub pages working seamlessly than I did with Cloudflare pages. Cloudflare pages was just much, much easier. And not to mention, like I said, I've moved a lot of my domains over. And so to set up DNS for those pages is all like integrated in one, one place rather than have to go to your domain provider and set up the GitHub pages and so on. It just became a lot more cumbersome. This is a lot more streamlined. Okay, I have one last question for you, Drew. The hat. Are you selling that hat like in a merch store or is that just for you? I told Tyler, I was like, this is my one and only hat. So no, I don't have a, I don't have a merch store. I just bought a custom hat. <laughs> I'm highly disappointed that there's not somewhere I can buy that hat. Okay, well, maybe I, maybe I need to alter that. Well, don't worry. I am currently in the process of spending around $36. We're going to have to talk after the podcast. I'm either going to need your addresses or a P.O. box or something to send this to. We are getting giant nuggy pillows. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. You can thank me later. Don't worry. I'm going to set that on fire in effigy. Um <laughs> Okay. Before too long, Matt's going to have an entire room of his house that's just, just nug- dedicated nuggies. to Nuggies, <laughs> nuggies oh <my>. merch. <laughs> okay, don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. All right, Tyler, did you come up with a, a, a Nuggie of the Week or are you still so non? No, I don't really have one. I mean, I can always do one. VR, pick A, <laughs> A topic. You know, you should download Steam VR if you don't have a VR headset yet. Just go ahead and, you know. Put one on Layaway, save up for one, buy yourself some games. Is Layaway still a thing? I'm <laughs> Actually, it is, because I know someone who put something on Layaway not too long ago, and that was my first thought, too. I was like, I didn't even know they still did Layaway. Okay. Uh, I, I, I just remember like, going into a Kmart back in the, <laughs> in, in yeah. the early ni- uh, 90s. Oh, there's a la- <laughs> Layaway department back there in the tuck from. in the back. And that's usually, like, usually when I, because you know, I remember the, I was like in the 90s, so I was like 10 years old. So that's where I'd hang out because that's where the bathrooms were. <laughs> okay. So my nuggy of the week is the Goodreads plugin for Calibre. Now, I have a Calibre video coming out 
eventually when I decide to edit it, probably tomorrow. And one of the plugins that I use, so one of the cool things about Calibre is that there's a ton of plugins for it. And you can extend this thing to do a ton of different things, get information from different sources, be able to hook it into your Libby account if you're getting books from the library, all sorts of stuff. But what I like about the Goodreads plugin and, and yeah, Goodreads not great because it's owned by Amazon and they never do any updates to the, to the website and it's, it's not great. But you can't deny that they have a ton of metadata and it's almost always universally better than what you get from other sources, especially like the cover for your books. A lot of times if you get it, you pull it from open library or something like that, you're going to get very low res for your, your covers. With Goodreads, a lot of the times you can get full HD scaling on your covers and you can get that through the plugin with Goodreads in Calibre. I, and the more I use Calibre, the more I love it. It's just fantastic. It just blows everything out of the water. I, I, I found some sources for ebooks. I've been buying ebooks like crazy in certain places where I can get them with DRM free. I've added like 60 ebooks in the last like two months or something like that. It's, it's insane. And I, I need to, uh, and that goes on top of what I had before. So I love Calibre. If you haven't tried Calibre, the, the UI is going to turn you off a little bit because it looks old, uh, but you, you can make it look better and it's really, really good. So the Goodreads plugin for Calibre, very good. So those are the nuggies of the week, guys. Uh, we Now we do, if you want to watch us live, you can do so every Tuesday. We never take a week off, I promise. Last week was just... It was a fake Tuesday, okay? Nobody knew it existed. And anyways, you can watch us every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time here on YouTube.com slash LinuxCast. We have a fantastic time in the chat. All of you guys in chat, hello, hi. Uh, we didn't ignore you, we promise. We, uh, we watched, all three of us watched the chat during the entire time, and you make us laugh uh, randomly. So if you are on the audio version and you hear us just laughing about something that makes no sense, it's probably because you missed... Uh, someone saying something hilarious in the chat and we just didn't read it out loud. So you just have to wonder what the lunatics on the podcast are actually laughing about. Uh, and I promise it's because of the chat. So if you want to be part of that community, watch us live every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Now, the other thing, now, here's a here's a quandary. This podcast won't actually be out in time, but if you are interested in a Linux user group, a virtual Linux user group, you don't actually have to fly anywhere. You can just sit in your jammies at your computer we do a Linux user group on this channel twice a month. And the next one, unfortunately for you who are watching the recorded version, you've already missed it. But if you're watching live, we have a Linux user group this Thursday at 11.15 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm not sure what the topic is. A.M., Matt. You said p.m. My, thank you. Thank you, Drew. Uh, yeah, 11.15 a.m. in the morning. This is the early one. The second one is late at night. Or later at night. Anyways, you can join us by joining the Discord server and find all the information there. Link for the Discord is in the video description or in the podcast description. And if you do miss this one, there's another one coming around. We do it twice a month. There you go. Uh, if you want to get in contact with us, you can do so at contact at email at the linuxcast.org. That's the best way. That's the email address. Uh, and if you want to get in contact with Drew or Tyler uh, via email, you can email that and I'll forward it on to them if you want to do that. You can also head on over to their YouTube channel. So Drew actually knows how to make YouTube videos. He's at Just a Guy Linux on YouTube, youtube.com slash Just a Guy Linux. He makes Debian and window managers and uh, he's, he's been doing the make a docs thing. It, it, a whole bunch of awesome videos. You should definitely check it out. Tyler also has a YouTube video site place where he puts videos on YouTube or he did. He, he's been a little absent lately because, you know, for a while, VR, right? You know, oh, it's so good. <laughs> who, who has time for YouTube when there's VR? So, but he's, you can go subscribe to his channel and watch some of his uh, previously uploaded content, youtube.com slash zany OG. All the rest of the contact information, including links to Discord servers and Mastodon and all that stuff for all three of us, is av available on the brand new LinuxCast website. The, lin the linuxcast.org slash contact is where you'll find that. That has links to all of our contact information. You can go there to find all that stuff. So, that is it for this one. We'll see you guys next time where we'll be talking about who God knows what. Something. That I'm sure it'll be interesting. Anyways, we'll see you next time. Boy.